You've tuned in to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint of Calvary Chapel, Houston. Here's a preview from Pastor Ron of today's message. There's a barrier between us and God. I may want to know God, have a relationship with God, but I can't do it on my own. There's this impenetrable barrier between God and myself. It's kind of like having a foot thick piece of solid steel and I've got a plastic hammer, I'm trying to get through it. You can hammer that thing your whole lifetime. You're not even gonna make a dent. And what is it that separates me from God? Isaiah 59, one says, God's hand's not shortened, that he can't save you. His ear's not heavy, that he can't hear. But your iniquities separate you from God. It can be difficult to break through a barrier if you do not have the necessary equipment. No matter how hard you try, you can become stuck in the same place. Have you thought about what is preventing you from seeking God? In today's message, Pastor Ron explains how sin prevents you from connecting with God. Jesus came into this world to die on the cross for your sins. He broke the barrier and restored your relationship with the Father by washing away your sins. All you have to do now is reach out to Him. Well, let's join Pastor Ron in the book of Colossians chapter 1 with today's edition of Large Than Life. So Colossians chapter one, we're continuing our study we've called Elements, looking at the core elements of the faith here in Colossians. Today I wanna talk about reconciliation. I read of a New Year's Eve party at London's Garrick Club, very exclusive club over in London. Actor Frederick Lonsdale was asked by Seymour Hicks to reconcile with one of the fellow members. The two had been quarreling over the past and had never restored their relationship. You must, Hicks said to Lonsdale. It's very unkind to uh, be unfriendly at such a time as this. Now go over there and wish him a happy new year. Lonsdale kind of crossed over the room, spoke to his enemy and said, I wish you a happy new year. Then he concluded, but just one. (laughs) Not exactly full restoration, not exactly a sincere gesture. Now, reconciliation is something that we deal with on a regular basis in all of our relationships. Many times we succeed. Many times we do not. In this section before us, we talk about, and we're gonna be looking at through Paul, God's work of reconciliation. That is both full and complete. So follow along as I read, beginning in verse 20 of chapter one. Paul writes, and by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross and you, who are once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven of which I, Paul, became a minister." So we've entitled this section, Reconciled to God, as Paul talks about this great work of reconciliation. And we're gonna look at five things. They all begin with the letter M. That's all I'm gonna tell you. The first is the meaning. What does it mean? Well, notice here, really, um, in verse 21, we have it at the end, and then, of course, here in the beginning of verse 20. This word is used twice in this passage. In verse 20, it says, and by him to reconcile. The word really means to bring together those who were at odds with one another, to take an enemy and make him a friend. There are actually five great doctrinal truths that take place when we give our life to Jesus Christ. We are justified, we are sanctified, we are redeemed, we are forgiven, and we are reconciled. In justification, the sinner stands before God as accused and is declared righteous. In sanctification, the sinner stands before God condemned and is declared holy. In redemption, the sinner stands before God as a slave, but is set free. In forgiveness, the sinner stands before God as a debtor, and the debt is paid. And in reconciliation, the sinner stands before God as an enemy and is made a friend with God. Romans 5.10 says this, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. At the root of this word, it means an alteration, a great change. It's the changing from hostility to friendship. Now, when I was growing up as a young boy, all the way up to about halfway in high school, 
I lived on a small cul-de-sac, and I lived, I hung around our neighborhood. There was 12 of us guys that were all within three, four years of one another. So we had a, a great time. We had great football games, baseball games, late night hide and seek. It was, it was a great environment. But I'll tell you what, when you have 12 guys hanging out with one another, it doesn't take long to have a few squabbles, which is a nice way of putting it, fights. Few bloody noses, a uh, few, you know, usually end up on the ground and, and, you know, bruised egos. This is the way it was. It happened at least once a month growing up. That's just being a guy hanging around with a bunch of guys. But you know what? We always seem to be reconciled. There was always a path made to make up with one another. Maybe one of the guys said, hey, later on, we're going to be playing football. Come over. He didn't mean it. And we'd hang out with one another. Ah, forget about it. We're all fine, you know. There was always a path made to be restored. Well, God has paved a way for us to be eternally restored. In the Living Bible, it paraphrases verse 20 saying, God has cleared a path for everything to come to him. He's removed the obstacle, which is sin, to be reconciled to God. Now, there's three ways, we're still talking about the meaning, there's three ways in which this word is used in the scriptures. Number one, between God and man. In 2 Corinthians 5, 20, it says, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Well, how is that possible? Because guess what? Sin is a barrier. There's a barrier between us and God. I may want to know God, have a relationship with God, but I can't do it on my own. There's this impenetrable barrier between God and myself. It's kind of like having a foot thick piece of solid steel, and I've got a plastic hammer. I'm trying to get through it. You can hammer that thing your whole lifetime. You're not even gonna make a dent. And what is it that separates me from God? Isaiah 59, one says, God's hand's not shortened that he can't save you. His ear's not heavy that he can't hear. But your iniquities separate you from God. I love the way the New Living Translation puts it. Listen, God is not too weak to save you. He's not deaf. He can hear you when you call, but there's a problem. Your sins cut you off from God. I like this, it's right in your face. So we need reconciliation. We're trying to break through with our little plastic hammer. Jesus Christ comes with TNT and obliterates it. It's possible through Christ. He has destroyed the barrier through the work of the cross, and we'll go on to talk about that. But this is why he came. In Luke 19, 10, it says, Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. He came on a search and rescue mission. We were lost. Isn't that interesting? I know I said it when I was first saved, and I still hear it all the time. Someone will say, I found Jesus. Newsflash, Jesus was never lost. You were lost, he found you. But I understand what you're saying. I found the Lord. Well, really, was he lost? No, but we were lost. He came on that search and rescue mission for us to reconcile us between God and man. There's a second way this word is used in the scriptures, and that's between man and man. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 23, if you come to the altar to bring your gift and remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift at the altar. First be reconciled to your brother, then come to me. So man is often divided by man. And there are so many barriers that separate us, right? Social distinctions, racial distinctions, economic distinctions, political distinctions, cultural distinctions. Man is greatly divided. Even Christians among Christians. Just as there are 31 flavors of ice cream, there are 31 flavors of Christians. Isn't that true? You know, some like getting dressed up on Sunday, some don't. Some like singing the old hymns, some don't. Uh, Some like uh, a lot of liturgy, some don't. And that's all fine, really, when you think about it. In fact, I think there are various distinctions within the whole body of Christ, different fellowships, you know, different strokes for different folks, as long as it's biblical. There are some people in the body of Christ of which we should be divided against, and that's those that don't teach the word of God. That's a different issue. But when it comes to Bible-believing, Bible-teaching believers, what's so unfortunate is that sometimes we don't get along. That's tragic. I read a little about a little boy And he said to his father, Dad, uh, what's a religious traitor? Well, son, a religious traitor is anyone who leaves our church and joins another. The little boy then said, well, if that's true, then what do you call people that leave other churches and join ours? He said, a convert. That's tragic because some people see it that way. In Ephesians 2.14, it says, though, that Jesus is our peace. He's made both one, that he might reconcile both to God in one body. Or to be one body. And you know, the, the early church was a living advertisement of this. Man, the only place in the Roman Empire where you could go would be the early church to find both Jew and Gentile worshiping together, to find both men and women on equal level worshiping together, to find both slave and master worshiping together. They were a demonstration of reconciliation. And that's what we're to be. 
And, and I thank God that I, I certainly see that within our fellowship. I mean, there are many distinctions represented here, a different economic, political, racial, cultural. What all, there are many differences here. But what unites us is our love for Jesus Christ to worship our living God. And then all those other things, just they just fall to the side. That's unity. But it's tragic that so many people don't have unity. They need reconciliation. How many marriages are dissolved because of irreconcilable differences? That's tragic. Heard the story of a couple, and they were having marriage problems, and so they went to a counselor, and, and the husband was a hardworking man, lived out in the country, didn't have much of an education, hardworking man, but didn't have this great vocabulary, didn't understand everything there was to understand about the Bible. And, and so he said to the pastor, Pastor, I, I, I think my wife and I need a recancellation. He meant to say Reconciliation. But the fact is, his words really weren't far off the mark. Because before we could have peace with one another, there does need to be a cancellation of sin. And then we can be reconciled, whether it's between us and God or man and man. There's a third way this word is used in the scripture. And guess what? That's something that involves all of us as believers. That's evangelism. In 2 Corinthians 5, 18, it says, God has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. That's the work he does. But then it says this, and he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. We are ambassador of Christ. As though God is pleading through us, we implore you, be reconciled to God. So we are now ambassadors. What do ambassadors do? Well, an ambassador is one who represents a king or a nation in a foreign land. As a Christian, I'm now, well, I'm a citizen of heaven my king is Jesus Christ. And so in this earth, I'm to represent him in my life with my words. And what is my message? My message should be, be reconciled to God. Come back to God. He's, he's paved the way for you to come to him. And that's something for all of us. We have the privilege of being involved in the process of reconciliation. From time to time, someone will ask you, hey, Ron, what makes you tick? What really you know, gets you going? What do you really love? And I'll tell you what I really love. If I was to put it simply, it would be being involved in this. I love what makes me tick while I'm in the ministry is seeing the work of reconciliation. Nothing excites me more than to talk to somebody after a church service who's been saved like a few weeks or a few months or six months and say, you know what? I gave my life to Christ recently and my life has never been the same. I'm like, yeah, that's it. That's what it's all about. Or someone who was a nominal Christian for so many years, like I was, who now says, man, I'm now reading my Bible. It's changed my marriage. It's changed the way I look at the world. It's changed the way I work. Everything has been changed. Awesome. And we're all to be involved in this process of reconciliation. It's a privilege. And isn't it, isn't it a thrill? If you've never experienced that, you're missing out. Because if you've even experienced it once, it's awesome to bring a friend to church and see God working in their lives, the wheels beginning to turn. Or you get to share a word of God or something from the scriptures with a coworker, and you begin to see the wheels moving. And, and sometimes you get to actually see him come to Christ. All of that is, is so awesome. So we're involved in this. So this word reconciliation means to bring together enemies, hostility to friendship between us and God, between man and man. And then God wants to use that to take it to the world. All right, let's move on. Let's talk about the manner. We've talked about the meaning. Let's talk about the manner of God's reconciliation. And, and it's twofold. It is both a broad plan and a personal plan. The first is a broad plan. Look at verse 20 again. And by him to reconcile, here it is, all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven. That's, that's a pretty broad plan. All things means all things. Things on earth, things in heaven, physical things, spiritual things. Listen, when God finished his creation, it says he looked at all that he made and said it was good. Animals, insects, I hard, hard to believe, even mosquitoes, you know, all plant life and especially man. But the moment sin entered the world, the universe was cursed. There was alienation from God. But one day, everything's going to be restored as it was before. So hold your finger here and turn to Romans chapter eight. I want you to see this, Romans chapter eight. So make a left pretty quickly, Romans eight. And we'll get a quick little lesson, though I'd like to turn more places on eschatology, study of last days. That has to do with God's reconciliation. In Romans eight and verse 19, interesting passage. It says, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. In other words, all creation is waiting for man to be glorified in that full reconciliation. For the creation was subject to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. All creation became subject to the fall of man. 
When man, though, is ultimately reconciled, so will all of creation, verse 21, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation is groaning for this, laboring with birth pangs together until now. So our whole world, solar system, universe, everything in creation is not winding up, it's winding down. Nothing is getting stronger, it's getting weaker. The curse of sin propelled everything into the law of entropy. As a result, the creation itself is groaning to be set back to a precursed state. And the Bible tells us there's coming a day where that's going to happen. Everything's going to be restored as it was originally when God created all things well. Now, in order for that to happen, though, sin has to be judged. Sin has to be dealt with in this earth. And here's the great thing. When it comes to me as a believer, my sin was judged on the cross. Whoo, I'm so glad about that. Because I'll tell you what, prior to Christ setting everything right on the earth, he has to judge sin. My sin is taken care of. So what is he gonna do? Well, what he's gonna do, then he's gonna remove the church from this earth before he judges it. That's called the rapture of the church. For more information on that, get your local teaching on that. We've done a lot on that. We don't have the time to get into the details. But in order to reconcile all things, the church is removed, and now we have to deal with sin. It's what we call in the book of Revelation the time of great tribulation. God's gonna judge the earth. Catastrophic, cataclysmic, natural, supernatural disasters. It'll be as if the earth itself is vomiting itself up as God is judging the nation. Let me give you just one reading from Revelation. Revelation 6, 12, there's a great earthquake. The sun becomes dark, black as cloth. The moon becomes as blood. The stars in the sky begin to fall like figs falling off a tree. The sky begins to roll up like a scroll. All the mountains, all the islands are disappeared. Vegetation affected, seas affected, fresh water affected. The whole creation is undoing itself. You say, what's the good news, Ron? Just this, in the aftermath of that judgment, God is gonna re reconcile everything to how it was before the fall of man. And so it's gonna be astounding. You could read it in the book of Revelation. The book of Isaiah has many passages. For example, Isaiah 35, six uh, tells us that the water is gonna gush forth again in the deserts. Isaiah chapter 11, it tells us the wolf and the lamb will lie down together, the leopard and the goat, the calf and the lion. Isaiah 30 and verse 26 says, the moon will shine as bright as the sun and the sun will be seven times brighter rejuvenated creation before the curse. And then we're told in Revelation chapter 20, after all things are reconciled, Christ will come down to earth and he will reign on the earth a thousand years, what we call the millennial reign. After that, a new heaven and a new earth. But here's the deal. All the earth will be reconciled as it was before and we will enjoy the earth in a precursed state for a thousand years. All right, now you go back to Colossians chapter one. We understand then what Paul is talking about when he says he's gonna reconcile all things to himself. Future fulfillment of the full restoration of the earth. Great lesson on eschatology. That's the broad plan. Let's talk about the personal plan. Verse 20, he's gonna reconcile all things to himself, things on earth, things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of the cross. Verse 21, and you. That's it, and you. He's gonna reconcile all things, that's future, but right now, he's in the business of reconciling individuals to him. And he wants every single person to be part of that plan. 2 Peter 3, 9 tells us he's not willing that any would perish, but all would come to repentance. He's made the way, he's paved the path, but the decision is yours, he will not force you. And so understand this, when he talks about all creation being reconciled, there are some who would say, well, that's universalism. In other words, I don't need to give my life to Christ. He's reconciling everything to him. I'm a, I'm a human being, and so I'm gonna be reconciled to him. No, that's not what he's teaching. When it comes to personal reconciliation, that's a choice. I have to willingly surrender my life to Jesus Christ by faith. I have to accept that on, on his behalf for me. The incredible thing is, in all this, is that God would wanna reconcile me to begin with. And this is, I guess, one of those things that leads you to Christ. When you consider your former state, he describes it here in the rest of verse 21. He, here's, I wanna reconcile you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind and wicked works, yet now he's reconciled. He's talking about the Christian believers here in Colossae. This was your former condition, do you remember? And this is the former condition of every single believer. We were once alienated. The word in the original language means cut off, 
estranged. We were estranged by God. Why? Sin. When Leonardo da Vinci was going to paint his masterpiece, The Lord's Supper, he sought for a long time to find a man that he could immortalize to be the picture of Christ. He found a young man. His name was Pietro Bandinelli. He was singing in the choirs of Rome. And he hired him to place his face. His face eventually became the face of Jesus on the Lord's Supper, that painting. Years passed, and before he was finished, he was now looking for a suitable model who he could paint Judas Iscariot, someone whose features of his face bore the horrible marks of sin. And finally, after a long search, he did find a beggar, a man of villainous countenance, and he sought that him you know, to be the man who would you know, be the face of the traitor, Judas. He totally transferred his features onto the canvas. When he was done, he paid them, and then, or he paid him, and then he asked, excuse me, what is your name? He said, my name is Pietro Bandinelli. I sat for you for the face of Jesus years earlier. The years of sin had left their mark on his face. All that lay between his face when he pictured, did the face of Jesus and his face of Judas was just years of sin. Sin debases our character, it ruins our lives, It alienates us from God. So this is our condition. We're alienated from God, and it gets worse. He says right here, enemies in our minds. Romans 8, 7 says, the carnal mind is at enmity. It literally means at war with God. In our flesh, we don't wanna please God. We don't even care what God thinks. All we care about is ourselves. And I guarantee you that that was me. In my fallenness, I didn't care about God. I was hostile towards God. Someone comes and says, hey, you know what God thinks? I don't care what God thinks, and I don't care what you think, and I don't like you telling me what you think God thinks. Get out of my face, you know. And I was going to a Christian school. Imagine that. But that's how we are. Now, some say, oh, I'm not that radical, dude. I, you know, you meet some people say, hey, I'm not, I'm not against Jesus. I think Jesus is a cool guy. I'm not really against him, but neither am I for him. Well, then the problem still remains because Jesus kind of drew the line in the sand when he said, he was not for me is actually against me. So you can't kind of waffle on the middle. In fact, in James 4, 4, it says, if you're a friend of the world, you really like the world, you've made yourself an enemy of God. So the fact is, before a person comes to Christ, before they're reconciled, they're an enemy of God. And then beyond that, he says, by wicked works. The NASB says, engaged in evil deeds. And that's true. Man, before I was saved, I was engaged in evil deeds. I partied like there was no tomorrow without any regard for God, without any regard for others. Just did my own thing. And I didn't like others telling me about it. And that's what John 3, 19, it says this. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And everyone who practices evil hates the light, doesn't want to come to the light lest his deeds be exposed. I don't want to come to the light. I don't want to come to church. I don't want to be around anybody who's going to tell me something about it. And I'm going to get mad if they do. So before Christ, we're alienated from God. We're enemies in our minds and we're engaged in wicked works. Yet, at the end of verse 21, now he has reconciled us. Is that amazing? We don't deserve it. His work of reconciliation is very broad, all creation, but he's concerned about me, and he's willing to go out of his way for me. The question is, how is that possible? How is that possible? Well, it's the third thing we wanna look at. That's the means. That's the means. How is it possible? Look back at verse 20, the end of it. Having made peace through the blood of his cross. That's the means. In Ephesians 2, 13, it says, we who are afar off and alienated by God have been brought near by the blood of Christ. I can have peace with God. I can be brought near to God through his sacrifice. In 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, it says, you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold. You, you couldn't buy your way into heaven. No, you were redeemed by the blood of Christ. We were reconciled by his blood poured out. And then look at verse 22 as we continue here. Jesus was sacrificed, notice, in the body of his flesh through death. So he really says it twice in this passage. In fact, if you look at verse 20, he makes mention of the blood of his cross, the blood of Christ. Here in verse 22, he talks about the body of his flesh, the body of Christ. And of course, this is exactly what Jesus talked about the evening before he was to go to the cross. In Luke twenty two nineteen, 19, he said, guys, this bread... After he gave thanks, he says, this now represents my body given for you. And then he took the cup and he says, this cup now represents my blood, which is shed for you. The bread and the cup represents the body of Christ, the blood of Christ poured out for us that we might live. 
Thanks for joining us here today on Larger Than Life as we go through the book of Colossians. Within this letter from the Apostle Paul, you find that there were some problems in the region of Colossae. There were some people who didn't believe that Jesus truly was God. This type of false teaching can enter into any church, and it's wise to be on guard for that in your community of believers. The most important thing about all of this is to know the Word of God and to live it out practically to those around you. May these messages further inspire you to continue on in your walk with God, not being swayed by things that are untrue. For more messages like this one, go to ltlradio.org. Don't forget that we also offer Larger Than Life in podcast format. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. You can also download our mobile app at ltlradio.org. Larger Than Life is a ministry of Calvary Houston, where Pastor Ron Hint teaches. We'd love for you to come visit or to join us regularly to be a part of the ministry going on here. If you have questions about what you heard today, feel free to call us at 281-648-5800. That's 281-648-5800. We're so happy that you joined us in the book of Colossians. Won't you come again? We'll be waiting right here on Larger Than Life.